So to move the conversation forward, we actually have one of the co-founders of the Mu R. Kelly movement, Orenike Odaleye, joining us by Skype. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you guys. So can you speak a little bit to how you started the Mu R. Kelly movement and if it was hard for you to kind of move forward with this in any type of way? Um, so the movement started uh, July of last year when the allegations came out about the sex cults um, that were happening here in Atlanta. Um, and I heard about it on the news. Um, and it just kind of infuriated me. One, because Atlanta is kind of the capital of child sex trafficking in the nation. Wow. But when I heard about that and I started doing some research, I saw that every couple of years, more and more young black women have been coming out um, talking about the sexual, physical, and emotional abuse that they had suffered at the hands of R. Kelly. And so I started the petition really just to get them off the radio. Like, okay, fine, we can't, for, for whatever reason, get justice for these black women, but can we not give him our dollars? Were you a fan, and how was that, you know, transitioning out of being a fan and saying no more? Um, I definitely was a fan. So, I mean, I think, you know, records like 12 Play and all that kind of stuff were also happening at the time that I'm coming into my young sexuality. You know, and so they are the kind of music people are playing in college. And so I understand how people are emotionally attached to these entertainers. They are the soundtrack of our lives. But that had to change how I thought about his music um, and whether or not I could, in good conscience, use that in my moments of romance and sexuality, knowing that that was some other woman's terror. And so I think we have to be able to think about the separation of that. We got to think about a Miles Davis as a genius and a Miles Davis who also terrorized and brutalized Cicely Tyson. You know, we have to be able to say, you know, while I can understand your artistic talent, the, the money that you receive from that, the support that I give you, then you turn around and use to brutalize other black women or to escape the consequences of your crimes. And I don't want to be a party to that. I think that was a really good point because so many people like to say you could separate the artists from their music. But like you said, when you make a living, you know, off of this and yeah, you're going to use that money toward this cult that you're running. And I feel like for some reason, people don't put two and two together. 60% of African-American women have been sexually molested before they're 18. Mm. R. Kelly's concerts are a majority of black women. So think about the percentage of black women who are there in that concert, who've given their money to a sexual abuser, who are themselves victims of childhood sexual abuse. There's such a disconnect there. You know, to that you can't put the dots together that I am supporting the trauma that was done to me. So I think that we really kind of have to, we have to be doing more kind of logical thinking when we think about who it is that we're supporting, what kind of people we're getting behind, um, and what constitutes um, a good black man who deserves our support and what constitutes one who doesn't. You know, just being famous and rich and wealthy and talented is not enough. Do you think that black women, we haven't quite dealt with what we define as sexual abuse? Because even, we were talking about this when we grow up, we're told that we're being fast or that we're being fresh and that we're putting ourselves in these situations. So where is the line between like, we've discerned this as sexual abuse or just we've taken the onus and put it on ourselves? We absolutely, with girls, we are still very much shaming them about all of their sexual experiences. You know, I absolutely reject the idea that any young woman is fast. Just the idea makes no sense. Mm -hmm. You know, at 12, 13, 14, you are coming into your sexuality. That is a part of your biology. Um, and so you're expressing it, exploring it, playing with it as part of, of growing up. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's such a critical time in both young men and young women's lives and how they're taught to about their sexuality is going to determine the kind of relationships they're able to have moving forward. This is the reason why R. Kelly is targeting 14, 15, 16, 17 year old girls. They have not found their sexual voice yet. And he hijacks their voice at a very, very critical point in their life. And when you look at these women years and years and years later, they've been having struggles um, with trying to have healthy, loving relationships. Absolutely. Mm. Um, in an action-oriented kind of way, can you tell us what is it that everyday people can do to mute R. Kelly? People can go to our website, muterkelly.org, and they can find out some ways that they can participate. And in their personal life, they can mute R. Kelly. When he comes on Spotify, Pandora, Tidal, whatever he's on, they can thumb it down. You know, when they see him coming to their city, they can make sure they're not buying tickets and they can talk to their friends about not buying tickets. So everybody can get involved and from wherever they are they can step up and say, you know, I'm gonna mute R. Kelly in my personal life, and hopefully that leads to stripping him of the resources that he's been able to amass to insulate himself from his crimes. Wow. Absolutely, yes. yes. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Oh, no, thank you guys, I appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much to Ornike Odeleye for joining in on the conversation. To hear what else we had to say about R. Kelly and black women, make sure to watch Listen to Black Women.